Welcome back to Blessings. Today, I'm talking to the fabulous and prolific Dash Hamblin. (laughs) (laughs) Dash has a vast career in acting, theater, playwriting, and production and media. He had his own popular magazine and published The World Times, a good news newspaper. He's worked with some of the biggest names in spirituality, including Louise Hay and Wayne Dyer. He hosted a radio show, The Good News Hour, a positive news show from ABC. He even appeared on the Phil Donahue show back in the day. He's all about the good vibes, and you all know that is my favorite frequency. But Dash has also seen his share of hardship. He went through a period of emotional highs and lows, resulting in great spiritual growth and prompting his desire to start a family. Dash became the first single gay man to adopt a child from the foster care system in the state of New Mexico. He is a pioneer as a father, and he's blazing a trail for his son, doing what fathers do best, helping him through pain and struggles of his own. Also, he's really funny, and he loves fashion, so we'll get into all of that. (laughs) Welcome, Dash. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? <laughs> I'm wonderful. I'm wonderful. Great so, to be with you today. Oh, it's gonna be it's gonna be an amazing conversation. I'm so happy to have you. So Thank you. before we dig into your life story, I want to start out with kind of a deep question for you. Are you ready? Okay. Okay. What keeps you up at night? Ooh. What keeps me up at night? I think I would say most of the time it's world events, things that are going on in the world, especially recently. I can't help but think about the atrocities that are happening, what people are going through in other countries, the discontent that we feel in our country right now. It's some of it's disheartening. And so it does keep me up at night. Yeah. Okay. We've established that you're human. So that's good. (laughs) Yeah. I think we're all. As I, as I check in with my friends, everybody says, oh, I'm not sleeping. I'm having trouble sleeping. I think energetically, we're all being hit with the what ifs. Could this, what's happening, what we're seeing currently today in Gaza and, and um, Israel, and that happened here in the States. And that's the conversation that I'm having with a lot of people recently. Yeah, I think we've been through a very rough period over the past several years. I've definitely felt it energetically. And I like to try to take a positive view that maybe this is Mm. a hardship that we have to go through. It's like a period of initiation so that we can come through to something better, a better world on the other side. So I'm hoping for that. I think the the basis for my life, the foundation, really comes from my parents. And they instilled in me at an early age, my mother instilled in me to have great faith. And my dad instilled in me to have great humor. So I think faith and humor is a thread that I use throughout my life to get me through, to hold on to as I'm riding this roller coaster, because it is, as most of us experience, life is, there's lots of ups and downs. And I like to think as a metaphor, I like to think of my life as being on the roller coaster. And when it goes down, it's going to come back up. And eventually it it rolls in and ends, right? (laughs) So I think in terms of anything that I face, I have to come back to that foundation that my parents laid pretty strongly within my own self-awareness and mindfulness to just know that with my faith and with humor, I can transcend anything that I'm faced with. It's beautiful. And we are going to get into your upbringing, but mm-hmm. I have to ask you on the roller coaster, where are you sitting? <laughs> are you in the front row or are you somewhere in the middle? Are you on the back? Oh, right now I'm in the front row <laughs> and it's definitely gone. It's I'm in a dip. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, we're gonna- Which is it okay. Is. It's okay. It is. I think ex- accepting that as we've learned with Buddhism, they say right up front, <laughs> this is going to be challenging. Life is challenging. Mm-hmm. So that's, and that's okay. So we embrace it and I'm here for the ride. I am too. I love that so much. <laughs> so where were you born? I was born in upstate New York, Rochester, New York, and 1960, a great year. 
a great year. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about your family of origin? What did it look like? I was first born. My parents married in 55 and then had me. They had miscarried the year before. My mother was apprehensive with my pregnancy. She was nervous the whole time. But yeah, I came out November 22nd, 1960. Sag, 45 minutes into Sag. And so I timed that perfectly. At least yes. you're not a Libra like me. <laughs> <laughs> Libra is a great sign. My, I my love son my is sign. a Libra. I love my sign. <laughs> yeah, it's a great sign. But and then five years later, my sister followed. And when she was born, she had a lot of health issues. And so the attention was on me for five years, which I loved. And considered myself an only child, even when my sister came. <laughs> so I, yeah, I just was, who's this other person that's moving in? Person that's taken up a lot of my parents' attention because of her health issues. I always felt as though I was an only sibling, even though my sister and I were close for many years. It, I come back to, what about me? I wanted all the attention. Um, and wow. so, uh, so you remember that consciously. Yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. Do you no. have a story about that you could tell? Some sort of a story that illustrates that? I just remember being taken to my grandparents' house because my sister was going to have surgery. She was a few days old, and my parents just abandoned me for a couple of weeks. I didn't see them. And, of course, they were going through a very difficult time with their newborn baby. But I can remember being at my grandparents' house going, what's going on? I don't understand this. I'm the center of the universe. And so everyone should be revolving around me. But I remember just being mad and angry because my parents doted on me for all those five years. And then to have their attention go elsewhere was a little alarming to me. Yeah. (laughs) Have you talked about that as adults? I did. I did. With my mother, we had a lot of conversations about this before she passed. Uh, She passed away in in 2014. And I was lucky to have that time with her to really, it's great to talk about those feelings that we have, these experiences that we have in our early childhood, and to have also a parent that's open in expressing their feelings and getting their side of the story. Yeah. And so that, that was where I came from in in terms of the family dynamic. I was always the person that they looked to for humor because my sister was sick and sickly through throughout her early years. I was the one because I wanted attention. I would try to make fun of everything. Mm, Okay. And you mentioned you spoke very fondly of both of your parents as we opened. And so can you just reiterate that and talk about what the role of your mother in your life meant to you as a young child and then your father? Oh, my mother was everything to me. She just, she was everything. I, she was my hero. I just, I loved all the little projects we would do. We'd do art projects and gardening projects. And she, she loved textiles and was sewing. So she taught me a lot about her insight into fashion and, and what that was. I gained a lot from her. She, my parents were both sheltered. They lived, They were born in Rochester, grew up in Rochester. They never traveled. Their life was what I would consider to be small and heavily involved in church activities. We were first Presbyterians. So I was baptized as a, as a baby in the Presbyterian church. And then eventually we moved over to a Baptist church, a born-again Baptist church which actually became a place where I found great solace and an escape from the rest of the world. I was a kid who, when I did go to school eventually, um, I was the kid that was always made fun of, picked on, beat up every day after school on my way home. And it was very, it was a demoralizing childhood because of that. And it didn't seem in the educational system, nobody was stepping in to help. And the teachers saw this. I can remember a lunch lady saying, making a funny comment to me about it's you're on your way home now after school and be careful out there because they're coming for you. Did you walk home to and from school? I did. 
I did. We lived very close to our school. I was only so that must have been pretty scary. Thinking every day I have to make it home. Oh yeah, yeah. It was. It was frightening, and it was something that I just learned to deal with on my own. After many years of this going on, I was now in in what we said junior high, middle school, and the same thing was happening. I was now taking a bus to middle school, and I was getting beat up on the bus. It was, yeah, I was really, I look at that and I use the word tortured during those years. And I was embarrassed to say anything to my parents. And it built up. So at the age of 13, one day I just came home and I, I just didn't want to live anymore. I just didn't want to live. And so at the age of 13, I walked out in front of a car on a busy road and was hit by a car. And my intention was that my life would end. Um, it was winter time. The car hit me. Uh, I did a couple of somersaults and I ended up in a snowbank across the, the road standing and just bleeding everywhere. And my parents weren't home right then and there. And the ambulance came and so forth. And my parents uh, drove up. My mom had gone to pick up my dad at work. We only had one car at that point. And uh, they saw that I was they had me laying down in the snowbank and they ran over. And my mother didn't show any love or concern. She just was upset. What would the neighbors think? <laughs> and I just remember thinking, oh, my God, why didn't I die? Why didn't I die? Yeah, that, that period of time was very difficult, very dark. And, uh, of course, we didn't. They didn't have therapists. They didn't really have school counselors that could deal with this. I went to our pediatrician. They checked me out. I had some stitches and so forth. And basically, just basically, everybody was just telling me what an awful thing I did. And I shouldn't do this to my parents and what's wrong with me. And it was a confusing time, certainly. Wow. That is very heavy. So your parents understood you had done this on purpose. My dad did. I think my mother knew, and she claimed that she didn't know because later in life we talked about it. And she just was angry that something like this would happen. And it was hard for her to really look at the fact that I wanted to end my life. And if, even after I told them I've been getting beat up at school, this has been going on for a number of years, and people don't like me. And my best friend was my dog. The solace that I would find in my life looking back is the relationship I had with my dog and artwork. I, I would write and paint a lot. I spent a lot of time listening to music, just being alone. Mm -hmm. And even today, that kind of follows me. I spend a lot of time alone and I use writing and I use and, and I have the relationships with my dogs and continued throughout my life. What kind of dog did you have as a child? We had a mutt. We just was, had a, what was the we name? had rescued her. Her name was Samantha. Tammy. Yeah. And she, for most of my childhood, she was around. And yeah. after she passed, then of course I went on, I've, I've had many animals, many dogs in my life. Yeah. Wow. Even though that was so difficult, uh, it's just so painful mm -hmm. to even hear you talk about it. Cause mm -hmm. I was a teacher for so many years and I saw those mm -hmm. kids uh, yeah. and I would never let that continue. I would, I would never let that continue. I don't, I never had a case of it that was that extreme, but I just can't imagine people allowing that, not no one stepping in, even though you didn't mention it, there had to have been people who saw it. And, but the idea that you were able to cultivate these healing practices is very significant. The idea of art, the idea of music, the idea of writing, mm -hmm. And the idea of connection with animals, those are all things we would recommend to someone who's going through a hard time. And you just did them instinctively, right. you know? Yeah. And that's why when I hear that the arts programs are being cut from yeah. schools, because that really, I'd go to the art room and that would be the place that I could get away from everybody. And it was an important part of my early childhood. And to me, it's disgusting that we put more emphasis on, and I think sports is great, and, and playing teams and doing all of that is great, but we, both, but we need to balance it with making sure that we have dance and music, theater and art. Uh, it's always been 
a really important part of who I am. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky for some reason I found that was my outlet and I was able Mm -hmm. to find that. And then when I was in high school, I discovered acting, which was therapeutic for me because I could delve into a different life, someone else's life. And it was, I just loved the outlet that it gave me, not only from a physical point, but the emotional part. I could channel my own emotions into characters that I played on stage. And it was a great release, actually. And I want to say probably, but no, I know that it was very healing for me to get over those things that I had gone through in the early childhood. Yeah. Did you find more social connection once you were a teenager? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. There was, um, and, and I think it was the the theater world, the music world within our our high school. And I was very active in our church and the youth group. And all those kids became very close friends of mine. And there are people that are still in my life today. And that's where I have a gratitude, a lot of gratitude for Facebook. Yeah. Um, (laughs) I know the the online venues are so great for social connection. And you really can cultivate some meaningful relationships that way. I love it. And after going through this whole phase of COVID where we were all isolated, it was great that we had social media to keep us all connected during that time period. Yeah. So there are some very positive things that happen with social media. There are. And it's good to look at those positive things. You're right. Yeah, yes. we have and to. So what about your relationship with your father? It was rough. The beginning years, he was into sports. He was that typical dad in the 60s. Uh, He was strict. Our family was, my sister's room was pink. Mine was blue. We had to live within those boundaries. My father was very strict and I was a good kid, but he was always on me. And it built up. I had a lot of resentment towards him uh, during those years because he to me, was the person who came home and straightened everybody out. Mm -hmm. And so when he'd walk in the door, I would, there was fear. Mm -hmm. And I do see where that also led to a respect. I wasn't allowed to speak up to him. I wasn't allowed to have an opinion, especially if it went against him. But I always felt like I was letting him down. I played... uh, He wanted me to be in baseball. Baseball was his thing. And I was in Little League. And I forgot how many seasons. It was like six or seven seasons I played. And I only hit the ball once in all those years. And here my father was a big sportsman. And he'd be playing or go out and play baseball with the neighborhood kids. And I just wanted to sit inside. And I'd rather learn how to cook. (laughs) Or do something else. I'd rather have a canvas out and paint than be outside playing sports. So my dad was so frustrated with me. And he showed that frustration early on. Mm. So I always felt like I was disappointing him. Mm. And it took it took a lot of years to to get over that. But we did. And we had a great relationship. And I probably, out of all the people that have transitioned, I, I miss him the most. I just want to sit with that for a second. <laughs> That's beautiful. When you got out of high school, where did you go next? Where did you go after high school? I went off to a state school, a state college, Geneseo, which is south of Rochester in the Genesee Valley. Beautiful school. I went there. They were known for having a great theater department. And that was my intention was to study theater. I thought maybe I'd become a teacher. Hmm. I wanted to go to New York. I wanted to try to have that acting career. So that was in the back of my mind. And in my going from my third year into my fourth year, friends that I had that graduated from college a couple of years before me, they said, oh, yeah, we're going down to the city. We're going to audition for some plays. Why don't you come down to the city? So I went with them and I went to an audition and I thought this would probably be a good experience. I'll audition. There were 400 and I was number 465 people were, and there was a line behind me. So there were 
quite a few people trying out. And it was for an off-Broadway show. And I was cast as the lead. Wow. And I sat there and I was like, oh, what do I do? (laughs) What now? I I got this. (laughs) I got this. And it was an amazing moment to be called and say, hey, we want you for the lead. I went back to school. I packed up my apartment and said, adios, I'm out of here. (laughs) And went to Manhattan with a hundred bucks in my pocket and sublet an apartment in Harlem. And I walked into Saks Fifth Avenue and applied for a job and was hired. And so (laughs) I was working at Saks as a salesperson in the sock department. (laughs) (laughs) And it was a really great, that little, it's a little sidebar. That was a great experience because I learned they put us through a detailed customer service program, how to take care of people. And that has serviced me my whole life. Wow. That was an incredible program. And and I sold socks. And at that time, they, we were on the main floor, men's socks. And what an introduction to Manhattan, certainly, and a world that I had no idea existed. So it was, and then I had my rehearsals. So I'd work there during the day, and then I had rehearsals for the play at night. And I was, oh, I was charged up. I just thought, this is everything that I want. It's the work at one of the country's premier retailers at that time. And to have that kind of experience was really neat. That is really neat. What what kinds of lessons did you learn at that time of your life? I, the first thing that comes to mind is at, at the time I was selling $100 pair of cashmere socks. And I can remember standing there going, who is going to buy for $100 for a pair of socks. And that was our best selling item. And that was probably uh, 19, <laughs> what, seven, in the late 70s? It was 1980. 1980. 80, 81. Yeah, 80 and 81 is when I first got there, the fall of 80. So it was, yeah, it was, it was an interesting time it, for me to be this kid from the suburbs of upstate New York and to be thrown into this world. And I'd go to fashion shows. I was invited to participate in all these wonderful things. My clients were incredible. They would bring me tickets to go to Broadway shows. And it was a very rich time in my life. And I was 20 going on 21. The lessons that I guess the one thing that they taught us at Saks Fifth Avenue, it doesn't matter what a person looks like. The person who comes in with raggy clothes is probably the wealthiest person in the world shopping at Saks. Uh, so that was a huge beginning for me in terms of how to look at people. Everybody is wealthy. And that was the, the idea. And of course, that has colored my life as I've grown into being 62 years old, is that everybody has a wealthy life. Oh, and it's not about I money. love that. If mm-hmm. you could look at every person as if they're mm-hmm. wealthy, everybody yes. is wealthy. Everybody is wealthy. Their experience oh. brings great wealth to them. So uh, that puts everybody on an even playing field in my life. And I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how much land you own. I don't care about any of that. Because in the end, we're all living rich lives. And it's just the perspective that we can take with that. And I say that as I'm right now in in kind of a downswing in my life right now, probably one of the poorest times in my life. And yet I feel like my life is so rich with the people that I know and the places that I've seen and the the work that I've done. So it helps, I think, certainly in how I view other humans. Let's talk about some other rich experiences you've had. What about New York City? And after this show ended, what was next for you? I kept moving on to doing showcases and I did lots of off-Broadway, eventually did off-Broadway. I did three national tours with plays. My focus was plays and theater. I was comfortable with the theater. Eventually, I had agents that came on. I had managers that saw me in an off-Broadway show. They signed me. They were called the Linhart Group. I was with Anne Wright representatives. I was going out on auditions for films and TV and more theater. And I was also 
a little frustrated with the audition process. For Torch Song Trilogy, I had 13 callbacks <laughs> and still didn't land the role. I was wow. up for every tour, every show that was going out from the London group to California, certainly. But uh, I felt like Peter Ship at the time, Shipper, Ship or Shipper, wanted me. He was the director. And I thought, well, he keeps calling me back and I keep reading. But I was getting frustrated because I wasn't landing the role. I did a lot of background work, which that has been in my life all these years, doing background stuff. Mm. But I couldn't. I just couldn't get to that next level. And I had a need to create. So after almost seven years, I decided to go back to Rochester. I had an opportunity to rent a loft space, which I turned into a theater and brought some of my friends that I had made in New York up to direct shows. And we started this loft theater and it was pretty much because I love the written word and I love plays. And I decided that it was going to be a playwright's workshop. And so I invited people who wanted to write and to create plays to come and take workshops. Um, I started teaching acting classes and we started producing one act plays that were original um, to our space. And that was an incredible creative project, an incredible time in my life. Because here I'd been in New York and I was starving, wanting to do something. And then all of a sudden I got to do it and be in charge, yeah. <laughs> which I like being in charge. Um, yeah. Yeah. So well, it was a wonderful time for that. Okay. And you were in your 30s during this time with the Loft Theater? Still in my 20s, my late still, 20s. Still in your 20s and doing this yeah. all on your own. Yes. Yeah. And then... I, I call this my manic phase for many years here. I So I was doing that. And then we decided to move to a bigger space. I started a relationship. It was my first serious relationship. And my partner was also in the theater. He was an actor, comedian, director. And actually, we lived across the street from each other in Manhattan and didn't know each other. Aww. And yet we were both from Rochester. So he decided to pull up stakes and he came upstate and we took over 10,000 square feet uh, space in a Masonic, old Masonic temple building in Rochester. And we had three live theaters, two art galleries, and I was teaching adult acting classes. We had our playwrights workshop that was still continuing. We started to present, I guess, more commercial we did chorus line, for instance, to draw in to make more money, mm -hmm. as well as doing our cabaret. We put together a cabaret group that would go out to restaurants and perform. And it was a very, it was a very rich time in my life. And I don't think I slept much at all. And during this, now I have the three theaters, the two art galleries, and I have an idea to start a magazine. Because I was thinking, how do I market my shows? It's so expensive to take advertising out. So I decided to start my own advertising vehicle, uh, a monthly publication called Daka Magazine. And it was really fashioned after Andy Warhol's interview magazine. And I had $850. And started. We just I, I spoke to a photographer to take pictures, a couple of writers to write for us. And we put together this publication. I had the idea and we had the magazine in our hands six weeks later. And that started a whole wonderful time in the publishing world. And that was another creative outlet. I acted as the creative director and we, we pounded it out. And after a couple of years, I, had, I went from having volunteers working with me to having 24 people on payroll. That's so interesting to me because that's one of the things I always admire. So I've been involved in the arts for many mm -hmm. years myself, and I always admire this about artists and people in the arts. They get an idea and they execute. There's no, how am I going to do it? Worrying about the pathway. They just mm -hmm. do it. And so mm -hmm. what can you say about that? How You got an idea to start a magazine. You loved Andy Warhol's. I, I used to absolutely devour Interview Magazine in the 80s. <laughs> right? I love that magazine. 
because yeah. it was so unusual. It was huge, and it was this newsprint. Yep. It was so beautiful magazine, and the pictures were amazing. The photography. Mm-hmm. But when you just got this idea, like, what was it that just gave you the impetus to just go? What did you have in you uh, that other people don't? I don't. I don't know if I can really answer that because it's happened to me several times with different projects. I just have an idea, and I'm like, let's check it out. I feel like anybody can do anything. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to have that idea about myself. Mm -hmm. Anything I want to do, go out and do it. It doesn't matter. You can find what you don't know. You ask a lot of questions. I'm curious by nature. I'm always asking questions. I'm always trying to find out what's behind all of this. I just thought, what's to know? I have a little bit of money. I just made phone calls to printers and getting an idea of what it would be to put together. And now this was the time before computers. So Mm -hmm. uh, everything was, I had to get a typesetter. It was a huge process to put together that monthly publication. Today we could do that. I could do that publication. We could do it daily with uh, the use of uh, our phones and cameras and certainly the internet. But at that point, it took 30 days to bring out the next issue and and a great team of people. I didn't do it alone. I had a great mm-hmm. team of people. And I love spearheading. I love when I could sit down, especially I started working with graphic designers. And I love that relationship with a graphic designer mm-hmm. and my photographers. Because I didn't come from that business, I didn't go to Syracuse to learn about journalism or anything like that. I didn't have the education. So all I did is I just had a creative spirit and said, we can do anything. What do we want to do? How do we want these shots to look? Who do we want to shoot? And people, after they saw the publication, everybody wanted to be in it. And so there was a great momentum that was, it was exciting to be a part of that. And and I did look to Interview Magazine. There was also Details uh, yeah, I Magazine. I remember that too. <laughs> yeah. And Cunningham was the photographer for Details. And he eventually went on to have his own column with the New York Times going out and shooting fashion on the streets of Manhattan. And so they really were my teachers as I looked to their publications. And so it's not that my ideas were original. They were original for a regional area, but the ideas were, they were already happening. Mm -hmm. So I was looking, who's successful in this business? I'm going to look to them. I looked to Vanity Fair, certainly, in their in-depth coverage that they used to do. I really Mm -hmm. miss Vanity Fair Mm -hmm. because that was the articles that were done, the exposés that were done were excellent. We don't see that kind of journalism anymore. So that, I, I really bow my head to those publications because I really took what they were doing and just recreated it for a regional publication. Yeah. And that's okay. The way that we generate ideas is by experiencing other people's iterations of things. And then we get new takes on it. We get our own look at things, our point of view. And Mm -hmm. so it's like ideas have that collaborative nature. Just Yeah. And And I think that everything we see is really recycled. It is. I've heard people say there is no such thing as an original idea. That'd be a, more of a philosophical debate, but right. very interesting concept because that's how you get your, that's how you get your ideas is because you're experiencing the world. You're not living in the vacuum. And I love that we took this idea and we, we just basically massaged it yep. over the course of several years. And it It also gave people that didn't have a voice, it gave them a place to have a voice. Mm, Like And a lot of artists, because we, every issue, I made sure that we interviewed an artist, Mm. that we always were promoting the arts. Mm -hmm. And that was important to me. And also interesting, when I buy a piece of artwork, I want to like knowing the person behind it. And their story. Absolutely. And that motivates me even in my the work that I've done now. I'm again, it goes back to my curious nature. Yeah. So it, it was that time period was very rich in a creative way. And also it was building the foundation of what I was going to do next. Okay. And so after five years, 
I was at a point where I was a little discontent. My relationship was over with. I had closed down the arts complex. I was solely focused on the publishing world and doing that. But I also was on a little different spiritual path. I had discovered A Course in Miracles. And I just felt like there was something more for me. And I wasn't sure what that was, but I was open to, you know what? I want to do something new and different. Did you and, did you ever think about that 13-year-old boy and and wonder oh, if this wasn't why you were meant to continue being I, I think that's something that I revisit a lot, certainly throughout my life at different times. I think about wow, what if I had been successful in ending my life at 13? I'd be missing out on all this other stuff. And so in times of, I deal with chronic depression, like a lot of people do in this world, and I'm pretty open talking about it. But there are times when I'm dealing with a down period and being depressed that I do revisit the periods of time when I did want to end it all. Mm. And I think, geez, look at the love that I've had. Look at the experiences that I've had. Why would I want to give this up right now? No, keep going, keep going. And that event in my life is something that is revisited occasionally and also helps me to overcome, which in itself is amazing. It is amazing. You have that event in your life that you can revisit. And it it probably helps you with the idea of what you might be here to do, a purpose or a calling of some kind. Mm -hmm. Did you ever think about Mm -hmm. in that context? (laughs) Yes. Yes. And I think that's what I'm going through right now is Uh, I'm in this transitional period right now. I'm like, what is my purpose? What can I do? I'm 62, going to be 63. What? Okay. I've had all this experience. I've done all of this. Now, what's next? What's next? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I pay attention to, in my meditation, I pay attention to my creative mind and because my creative mind is what's pulled me through in the end. Mm -hmm. At any period that I, uh, let's say a dark period, it's my creative mind that pulls me out of it and gets me onto the next lily pad. (laughs) Oh, that's a great visual. It strikes me that as a child, and you went through such a difficult time, Mm-hmm. and struggled so much that you went into a period of great light where you had this striking confidence about you and were able yes. to start these things. So yeah. how did that transition take place? How did you get to be this person of such confidence? I think it was to overcome being an introvert, overcome being shy, and just saying, this. pardon my expression, but fuck everybody. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to survive and I'm going to thrive and I'm going to continue to be a person of worth and value. Mm -hmm. Now, do I have that every day? No. (laughs) But when my back is against the wall at different points, I really, that's what I come out with. Mm -hmm. You have a resilience. And I will say it gets gets harder as you go on and as you age. It can. Yeah. It, it can get harder. Yeah. I, I think this mm-hmm. period of life in the 50s and 60s is when you do a lot of reflecting. Yeah. And and also I I struggle with because a lot of my friends are retiring and mm. they've worked very hard to have the lives that they have right now basking in the sun. And I feel like I'm still trying to get it together. What am I going to be when I grow up? So it's an interesting time. And I try not to look at my peers and my friends and say, look at their lives, look what they're look what they're doing. But I can't help but doing that. But I try to put it to the side. I'm like, that's them. And I have my own journey, my own path. Noticing it without judging it or harshly judging yourself in relation. Because I do. I say, why don't I have this or that? Or why isn't this happening? Um, and I have to sit back and go, it's okay the way it is. It's right. really okay. Because it's your path. And again, it, 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 yeah, and it's an embracing, again, it's a, just saying, okay, I'll just stay on this roller coaster. It's okay. <laughs> Bringing it right. back to that. <laughs> yes. 
That's true. I, I love the idea of the roller coaster and I love riding in the front. Have, if you've never ridden in the front of a roller coaster, folks, get in the front seat next time and take it around the track. Yeah. It's a much better ride from the front. <laughs> <laughs> Even though the ups and downs are there, it's a much better experience. I love that. All right. So take us to, into what happened next. You're really focused on the publication. Yeah, I ended all that. I ended my life in Rochester and it was, like I said, diving into A Course of Miracles. And a friend of mine in Rochester, Deborah, called me one day and she said, oh, I just got this magazine. It's based on The Course of Miracles. It's called Miracles, Miracle Magazines. And they're looking for a creative director who also does sales and marketing. And she said, I just have a feeling you should contact them. I said, where are they? And I thought maybe they were in New York. She goes, no, they're out in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I said, Santa Fe? I had read some <laughs> books and I, I knew Tony Hillerman's work and some of his books take place, the stories take place here in Santa Fe. So I thought I could contact them and send them my resume. And so I did. And then they asked for my portfolio. And at that time, we didn't have digital portfolios. So I shipped out my portfolio and they hired me over the phone. Okay. And so I just thought, okay, I'm going. I got on a plane. I came out here. I didn't know anybody out here, of course. I rented an apartment through going to the library and looking up the newspaper classifieds. It was quite a process yeah. back in the day, right? We didn't right. have the internet to look at. Uh, and I came out here and I remember getting off the bus in front of, we have a hotel downtown called the El Dorado, got off the bus from the airport and I was meeting the people I was going to sublet their apartment from. They were picking me up there. And as soon as my foot hit the pavement, this surge of energy came up and it was like, you're home. This is home. This is going to be an incredible place. And it has been. Yeah. Yes, Santa Fe is yeah. like that. I've only been there once, but it was really like that. It makes you not yeah. want to leave when you're there. You really, it right. is really that kind of place. Yeah. Yeah. And boy, I had no idea what was ahead of me. And so I went to the magazine and started my work on it. And the magazine was great because it introduced me to a whole group of people that I've admired for years. And you mentioned some of them in the beginning. I met Louise Hay through the magazine, Marianne Williamson, and eventually Wayne Dyer. Mm -hmm. And so I recreated the magazine. And while I was there, I just kept thinking, when you own your own business and you've had that experience and then you go work for someone... It's great because you don't have to worry about, okay, the paycheck's coming. You don't have to worry about that part of it, but you don't have any control over anything else. Mm. And that that was hard for me. Some of it was probably ego coming up. Some of it was common sense. I just would run this organization differently. So during the time that I was there, and again, I had this creative outlet and recreating the magazine. And they really let me do whatever I wanted to do, which was really wonderful. But there was this feeling of, I want my own business again. Mm -hmm. And during this time period, I met a gentleman who started talking to me and said, why don't you do your own? What would you do if you wanted to do your own publication? And I said, I think the world really needs to focus on positivity and good news. And he said, what a put a business plan together. So I did one night. I just put together my ideas on a business plan. I faxed it to him. He was in California. And he ended up after some go arounds with the business plan and he had some great suggestions for me. He said, you know what? I want to invest in this. And he invested in this publication, which then came the World Times, the Good News newspaper. And it was a broadsheet publication like the New York Times. Mm -hmm. Even though the news, the content is going to be so different, I want it to look familiar to people. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows at that time, certainly newspapers. Mm -hmm. So I wanted it to be broadsheet. And that's what we created. So within a couple of months, we had our first issue. Mm -hmm. And I had contacted Louise Hay and Wayne Dyer, Deepak Chopra, Deepak's son, Gotham Chopra, was at Columbia University at the time, and he had come out with his first book. 
I called Gotham up. I said, hey, what, can you write for our publication? Because that he represented the next generation of new thought, mm-hmm. new age information. And certainly we were connected with his father and New World Library, which was a publishing firm out of California, had a lot of authors that we promoted and they wrote for us. So I just started calling people saying, hey, I'm doing this publication. You want to write for us? I need your article by next week. <laughs> <laughs> so I had, I guess, a lack of a better term, I had balls and just said, hey, then my thing was with distribution. How am I going to do distribution? Yeah. And I called the New York Times. I found out different names of people that were ahead of distribution. I met this one guy who said, I love your idea. I want to help you. Oh. I will help network you, even though he was with the New York Times. He goes, I'll help network you with distribution outlets. So before I knew it, just as we were ready to premiere, we had distribution in nine countries. Oh, my God. We had representation in nine countries because of that one phone call. Wow. And uh, so we premiered. I was, oh, I was over the top excited about it. I had Barry Paris, who I did some research work for him. He's a writer. He was known to write, oh, he did a book on Greta Garbo, Louise Brooks, great writer. And he did an article at the time on Haiti and what Haiti was going through. And it was a wonderful article. And we premiered with that on the cover. Again, looking at the positive uh, side of stories. And we were out about, oh, four or five days. And I got a call from the Phil Donahue show. The executive producer called and said, hey, we just saw your newspaper and Phil wants to have you on the show. And we're going to fly you to New York if you can come in and uh, we'd like you to sit in the front row and we'll show your newspaper. It's going to be a media debate with Howard Kurtz from the Washington Post at that time. Now, then he went on to CNN, but he was with the Washington Post and Dan Rather has a new book coming out. So they're going to be up on the stage talking, but we want to talk about this. We're going to talk about the state of the media and negative media, but then we want to come to you and promote the World Times. I go, okay, I'm ready for that. I can sit there and hold up my newspaper and have Phil talk about it. And that was that. I go to New York and show up in the green room at 30 Rock and I meet Howard Kurtz and then Dan Rather comes in and he introduces himself and we're chatting a little bit. And he said, oh yeah, I saw your newspaper. I'm I'm really impressed with what you're doing. Actually, I asked Phil if you could be on the stage with us. <laughs> and oh my God, I almost stroked out. I was like, I, I don't know, Mr. Rather. I don't know if I'm ready for that. I just premiered with this publication. I don't know. I haven't worked. We were hiring a PR team out of LA. I haven't even started to work with Rogers and Cowan or Cowan and Rogers, whatever they were called. And I said, I don't know if I'm really prepared for this. And he said, you're here and we should do this. They put a a chair up on the stage for me to sit (laughs) and be involved in this conversation that I was clearly not ready for that. But I tried to seize the opportunity best I could. And it was an incredible experience. It was amazing, actually. Taught me that I always have to be ready to talk, right? Yeah, (laughs) your whole life is like that. Just go for it. You don't have to be all the way ready. You don't have to know all the answers. You don't have to know exactly how you're going to get there. Just get started. Right. And it's always good to have sound bites. (laughs) <laughs> it sure is. I'm learning about especially, that. <laughs> yeah, especially with TV, right? It, it, you you yeah. get two seconds and you, you have to have your sound bites ready. So I did learn a lot from that whole experience. And coming off the stage, it was exhilarating. It was an exhilarating time. And, and to meet Howard Kurtz and a couple of the other people on the panel, and Dan Rather, who was who really became a hero. Both him and Phil, I, I looked to them as being outrageously great people and their work was well done as we say yeah yeah I, but it was amazing when it aired I, I my phone didn't stop my phone didn't stop for two years oh my gosh yeah it was right. amazing that platform was incredible wow yeah and yeah. Uh, so we carried on and we gained certainly a lot of subscribers from that show and yeah it was a wonderful ride what age were you at this time I'm now 
32s. Okay. So early 33s. 30s. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now I know you mentioned that you went through an emotional period in your thirties. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about that a little bit? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff was happening. I was doing the newspaper. Disney came to me, wanted to work on a TV show. So in Florida, I was going to Orlando every week, working with a group of people out there to possibly launch at least a pilot. So we worked for several months doing that. And unfortunately, I had a couple of people that I had running the newspaper that really shouldn't have been doing that while I was away. Mm. And it created some issues, staffing issues. And yeah, I ended up actually one woman who worked for me, who I knew in Rochester, we had worked on a lot of nonprofit boards and events together for nonprofits. She wanted to come out and be my sales manager. And it ended up, we had a contentious relationship that ended up in lawsuits. And it totally put me down. Mm. It totally, it just wiped me out. I couldn't, I mentioned that I deal with chronic depression and we never know when that depression is going to hit us. Mm. Those of us who deal with it, it could be just something that someone says to us that just all of a sudden darkness comes. And I I couldn't get over this whole thing. There was public humiliation and my self-worth. Again, it just I just went back to almost as if I was back in grammar school being beaten up by the kids after school. Yeah. It was reliving that. Yeah. But in a grown up world now, yeah. right? Yeah. And it was brutal. It was yeah. brutal because my intention is I'm a pretty, people who know me, I'm a pretty gentle spirit. And and this, having a lawsuit with someone who had been a family friend, just did a number on me. And it also became so public because the local newspapers did little stories on it uh-huh. and made me look to be like I was this terrible person. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't get out from under that shadow. And it really did. It it put me down and it stopped the work that I was doing. It really, I was, was paralyzed. It? I guess the word, I was yeah. paralyzed by it. That was a tough spot. That was a tough spot to be in. Was that the and end of the newspaper at that time? It was pretty close to it. I had then premiered, because I had, the, the World Times was based in a lot of the new age I decided that I really wanted to, I had met Frances Moore. She wrote a diet for a new world, I think is the diet for, I think it's diet for a new world. Anyways, we were guests on an NPR show on the media many years during when I was doing the world times. And she came out with a news service called the American news service. And it was taking, it was a nonprofit organization that had award-winning journalists from around the world would write solution-oriented news items. Mm. And I looked at that and I thought, okay, what they're doing is basically the same thing that we are. They they need an outlet. So I started New World News, which was a tabloid formatted, the New York Post, not with its content, certainly, but with the style, newspaper and periodical. And so I started New World News, a solution-oriented newspaper, Mm. periodical. So what was great about this is that we were looking at the problems that were happening. For instance, in Florida, just I'll tell you real quickly, there was a a school that kids were dropping out of school. They they weren't finishing their education Mm. in high school. And A teacher decided to go to the school board and say, hey, I have this idea. What if we can graduate the kids early and they only have to come to school three days out of the week? Because a lot of these kids they were finding really wanted to work and make money so that they could buy stuff. They didn't put the emphasis on education. And so this teacher started this program and a year later, the percentage of kids graduating was almost 100%. Mm. So 
that was the kind of thing that we were uncovering, looking at political issues, social issues. And during this time period, uh, we had an article come out about this family adopting kids. And that sat with me. And I thought, what am I doing? I'm chasing, I want to make money, I want the big house, I want all this stuff for myself, but what am I really doing in this world? And so this idea of creating a family, the seed was planted. And in August of 1993, and then and the date was is important, August of 93, I started to have dreams about being a dad. And I had called my father at one point, and we, we, we spoke every couple of days. And I said to him, I said, I've never thought about having a family because I'm gay. And if you're gay, a gay male, you can't have kids. But the idea of being a father was so strong in me and all these dreams I was having. And my dad took note that he said, I think you should go for it. I don't know how you can do it, but... Why not create your own family? So I started to do some research and started to work with an orphanage out of Hong Kong or an adoption agency mm -hmm. who then worked with an orphanage out of Hanoi, Vietnam. And I was going to adopt a little baby boy from the orphanage there, was going through all the stuff that I needed to go through. And I was uh, pretty close to going to Vietnam to pick up this little character and uh but the prices kept going up uh -huh. what started out to be eighteen thousand was now hitting close to forty thousand dollars that i needed oh plus i had to go to vietnam and stay there for two or three weeks okay so financially it was becoming burdensome yeah and so much so that i said no i, I can't do it i can't do it and i was really i was pretty down about that and then someone here in Santa Fe hooked me up with Mother Teresa's organization in Calcutta to adopt a little girl from there. But then, because Catholic Charities was involved, they sent the paperwork, and I had to, I had, they want you to sign a piece of paper saying that you're not gay oh. and that you'll never be gay. <laughs> okay. And I thought, okay, I'm first off, I'm going to be open about who I am as a person in this world. And I'm certainly not going to sign something like that. I'm not going to start my family yeah. based on some kind of lie. A lie. Yeah. So then I backed away from that. And that was devastating to me. And then one of my employees said, did you know you can adopt out of foster care? I had no idea. So I ended up calling the local office, the foster care office here in Santa Fe, and I spoke to the social worker who said, yeah, as a matter of fact, you have to take a parenting class, an eight-week class, because you have to be certified to be a parent, but our classes start tonight. And I said, okay, I'll come, I'll be there. So I started that process which was pretty incredible because I had never been exposed to the foster care system. Certainly no one ever talks about foster care, right? right. We never hear any politicians or any yeah. leaders in our community. They never talk about it. Yeah. And yet we have over 600, currently 600,000 kids in our country oh. that are in foster care. I took the course and became certified to be a parent and they did a home study and we started that process. And all in all, it was almost a four-year process before I had placement. And a lot of what I was dealing with is because I was a single gay man. The, the other social workers in New Mexico really didn't know what that looked like. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time I was out with my social worker, communicating with other social workers and their managers and their departments to talk about the fact that gay people can be parents too. And there had been lesbian couples who adopted, and there were a couple gay men who had adopted out of foster care. But a single gay person was really unheard of at that point in yeah. time. And so finally, I had read a, a paragraph 
not even if I didn't even have a photo, I just had a paragraph of my son. And I read that paragraph like three or four times. And I kept thinking, this is my son. This is my son. Mm. So we campaigned to meet him for two years. Oh my God. And every social worker that he had just said, no, I'm not a gay single man. No, 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 no. They were against it. And finally, he did have a social worker, this young woman who had a gay uncle who raised her. Mm-hmm. And I reminded her of her uncle. And so she said, yeah, let's meet. And so the process started Aww. for Matthew to come to me. Mm-hmm. And I will say right up front that everything I've done in my life is for this moment to take on this kiddo who was four, four years old. And, and eventually he moved in with me and we became a family. Yeah. Wow. So he's my greatest treasure in this life. That's for sure. And it has really been an angel on earth, really, for me. So many things, as people know who have kids, they come into this world and they teach us a lot about who we are. (laughs) That's for sure. Yeah. How did it change you becoming a father? Oh, wow. (laughs) Wow. In every which way. It scared the hell out of me when he finally moved in and he went to the refrigerator and he opened the refrigerator and all he could find was yogurt and and Corona beer. I started grocery shopping differently. (laughs) And yeah, it's wow. So much. I, it, it's hard to even know where to start with that. I think a lot of things that happened to me in my childhood, mm-hmm. as Matthew was so different, he helped me heal a lot of those things that happened yeah. from the experiences then he had in school and his perspective on how he would look at things. It's uh, There's probably a million different ways how he's changed my life. Certainly, I've never felt love the way I would lay my life down for this person. I can never say that about any other period of time in my life or even anybody else that I've cared about. I would go to the ends of the earth to make sure that he's okay. And if that meant giving my own life up for him, I would. So that's a depth of character, a depth of feeling that certainly I never felt until he was in my life. And of course, it didn't happen right away. It's been 26 years now, but I'll never forget because people would say when I first adopted him and they'd hear, oh, you know, that I adopted as a single dad, people say, oh, you're a hero. You're so wonderful. This and that. And I'd feel empty with that because I was like, I didn't do this for that kind of attention. And I didn't feel, okay, I was going through the motions of being a dad. And I knew that people were going to look at me and dissect me differently because I was gay and a gay dad and I chose to do this so I wanted everything to be perfect Mm. and I soon recognized that not everything's going to be perfect about this (laughs) (laughs) and I also the one thing that I did learn was I have quite a voice I could yell and I was never anyone who would raise my voice and now wow um, that was like where did that come from I remember the first time I was screaming and yelling about something that happened in the house. And I was just like, what's going on? You know, I thought, oh my God, who's this person that's screaming and yelling? <laughs> Maybe did it help you understand your parents a little bit better? Definitely my mother. Yeah. 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 And that's the other thing too. I would say to my parents, geez, I'm sorry I judged you. I was really judgy as a little person. Didn't mean to do that to you. Oh my God. Because I was so making funny. a lot of the same mistakes. Yeah. But Wow, what a journey. What a journey. Yeah. So you got to be a dad. So, and how old is Matthew now? 30. Wow. What would he say about you as a dad? What would, how would he characterize you? I, that's a good question for him. I hope that he would look at me as being someone who stood by him through it all. Yeah. And hopefully see me as a protector at some point or at some point different points in our lives, shared lives. But I I hopefully, oh, I know he loves me and he gets a, he gets my sense of humor. He enjoys, we share a lot of laughter with each other. Yeah. And this whole thing too, I started out saying how my parents instilled in me faith and humor. 
I've tried to do that with him. And he has a, wow, he has an incredible uh, sense of humor. And he's so compassionate. So I'm very, I'm very proud. I'm very proud of who he is in this world. That's yeah. the best we can hope for as parents, right? And recently I saw this play out in July of this year. He was walking down the sidewalk and he was hit by a truck and run over. His right leg was crushed. It was a hit and run. And that phone call was awful. That phone call was every parent's worst nightmare. Thank God he's okay. Thank God he survived. But what I saw through his surgery, and now we've gone through his rehab with all of this, learning to walk again, and his sense of humor and his generosity of spirit is just off the chart. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. And as awful as this event was for us, for him, certainly, for me in a different way, it's also a blessing because I'm able to, as his parents, see that, wow, he has these skills of survival that are just, will get him through anything. Mm -hmm. That's, in a way, this was a gift for me at my age now to say, okay, he can carry on if he needs to. If I'm not around to be the cheerleader, he can carry on. He has that strength and will and determination that I would hope he had but he but i saw it in in great a great display of it through the last number of weeks and that is a, a gift to me as his parent to be able to see that to recognize it i'm glad that um, he's okay now that yeah he's recovering um, yeah did they find the person who hit him no that's the disheartening part of this yeah you think with all the mm -hmm. cameras around they would mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's it's that's the unfortunate part of the story um, for us because certainly it would have helped us in in the recovery of all of this uh, yeah. from a financial standpoint. But sure. um, it's also I was able to be in the hospital with him twenty four seven. I was able to be home during this whole time with him. So again, even though I said like I'm in my own transitional period of what I'm yeah. going to do next with my life. Boy, it was important to to have this time with him. Did you consider the parallels between father and son both being hit by a car? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What do you We've talked about it. Yeah. Actually, he, he's brought it up to me. Yeah. I, I think the thing that in our conversations about this, we just come back to survival. Yeah. Yeah. Survival. Yeah. Resilience. Survival. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The power we have to heal ourselves. Mm -hmm. And also through what I saw with what he's gone through is he was acutely aware that he had to lift the people up around him, whether it be the doctors, the nurses, the even the people coming in to clean his room at the hospital. He just saw it as his job. Everybody's being real sad around me, but I'm going to show them that they don't need to be sad. I'm mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. And he showed them a lot of gratitude for them taking good care of him. Mm -hmm. Everything that I would want to instill in a young person, mm -hmm. those seeds that we plant along yeah. the way. And I started to, I, I could see could see that happening with him. And, mm -hmm. and I like to think too, that I've been that way with my life as I've gone along and hopefully in a small way, in a small measure, being able to inspire people along the way, no matter what we're dealing with. And I said to him, I think what's so great is that it's real, it's authentic. It's mm -hmm. truly, we use that word, I'm living authentically, but mm -hmm. really taking it down and doing a deep dive with it, it's okay to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It's okay to, to let people see that. And it's okay to come out of it. Mm -hmm. and hopefully use whatever happens to us to inspire other people that's what yeah. it's all about so what is next for you <laughs> wow i don't know the past seven years i segued into working in the financial world doing residential mortgages okay an opportunity came up and i seized it it was came at a 
point when I needed to do something for my economic life. And it was presented itself in a way that I was like, okay, this is a no brainer. I have to do this. But the market changed so drastically Mm. after we came out of the first part of COVID, the first part of that uh, devastating period of time of shutdown and so forth. And out of that and, and, and the market with rates going up. And we also live in a city, Santa Fe, very expensive place. And people coming in buying the three and four million dollar homes are not getting mortgages. They're paying cash. Yeah. So my personal business just plummeted the beginning of last year. Okay. And um, so much so that I just couldn't recover. And I was working for a great company. I love the company I was working for. I love the culture. Um, very much aligned with how I want to live my life. And it was devastating. March 1st, I was let go because I didn't meet my quotas. Oh. And that was hard. That was hard after seven years. So there's a part of me that people are saying, you've just had this recent experience in the finance world. Why don't you stay in, in mortgages and real estate? And I'm pausing because I'm thinking, okay, this is a time for me to reassess. What do I want this last chapter to be? Mm -hmm. What do I want to do? And what is my purpose beyond this? Mm -hmm. Maybe it is to be stay in mortgages. My intuitive sense is saying, no, it's not. There's something else. So that's what I'm sitting here with right now today. Yeah. Yeah. So I love that idea that some parts of your life are just about being in the pause it's like that spot where you get to the roller coaster and you haven't gone down you go, yeah, yeah, you're not quite <laughs> one way or, or the other or it's before you go up you yep. know, just or before like, in the dip go, or before it dips yeah like ah, okay yeah yeah that's probably where you are right down here I'm down, yeah that. just ready to go back up and looking around going who am i in this world yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And we should do that. We should do that periodically. Mm -hmm. And we do naturally do it, but to be intentional about it, there's something magical in that. And I knew this past year as the the writing was on the wall, I kept putting my head in the sand going, oh, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I'll get through it. Mm -hmm. But I think all along I knew maybe this period, this what I've been doing is coming to an end and I need to ready myself for something else. And I was just like I said, putting my head in the sand until someone else said. Yeah, the universe will do that, right? (laughs) When it's time to stop one thing and start something new. Yeah. If you don't do it yourself, someone will close the door for you, right? Yeah. But that's really interesting about your life is that it has been a series of these endings and beginnings, which is true for everyone. But The idea that you've been able to weather it so gracefully that I'm sure that is going to be the case now. You'll just come through it with grace and something amazing will be waiting for you. when It's It's interesting that you use that word because I think a long, long time ago, there was a guru that I, I went to hear some lecture at a church of religious science at the time. And I remember this person saying, no matter what you're faced with, just have grace, walk through it with grace. Yeah. And uh, that always, that stuck with me, that teaching of this is going to be, this might be hard. This might be a little rough. It might be a little challenging, but, you know, try to have some decorum. <laughs> well, that's walk through this with grace. We can all yeah. point to times in our lives when things have ended and we haven't mm-hmm. faced it with grace. I know I can think of times sure. when I was, in despair over something or too overly upset or overly angry or overly hurt. And I hate to use the word overly because we feel what we feel and that's real. But the idea that trying to move through with an understanding of the roller coaster and the ebbs and flows, Mm -hmm. the ups and downs are natural. That helps you to contain yourself and to have dignity and decorum when you're going through these transitions. Early on in my life, I could when relationships would end, when I would think, oh my God, what I put myself through, mm. instead of just stepping back and going, yep. it's okay. Yep. It ended. It's it was for the what best it was. When it ends. It's because right? there's something better on the way. Yeah. That's- typically, I think that is very true. Yeah. I think that's true. 
And I'm lucky because I've lived long enough to be able to have a history to look back and go, oh, I didn't handle that too well. I want to make sure that I do it a different way now. So, and that's one thing. I had a lot of friends who died from AIDS in the 80s and 90s. And and, and certainly a lot of people been taken by cancer in my life. And so I, I look at that and say, I have to continue living because they're no longer here. And I have their story to tell. Mm. Those of us who are left, that's what we have. We have their story to tell. And so that helps us to continue living our lives Mm -hmm. because we carry them with us. Mm -hmm. And I'm just reminded of that more so now being at this age when a lot of people are dealing with a lot of end of life issues. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I don't know, that just helps me get on is knowing that, okay, I have their story to tell. And that's a responsibility that we carry. Yeah, yeah. All of your creative pursuits have been about storytelling. And I have a Mm -hmm. feeling that you're going to be involved in that again. (laughs) I guess we'll see. (laughs) (laughs) So can you talk about, we'll end with the lessons Mm -hmm. and the blessings of your life. Can you talk about what you think are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned in your life? Wow. Just keep on loving yourself. Love those around you. If you're lucky to have animals in your life, love your animals. Love, yeah. just love. I. It sounds corny, but even when I go to the market, I just think whoever I encounter, I'm just going to send them loving vibes, even if I don't talk to them. Yeah. I think being in that state uh, for me is really important. It doesn't matter what I'm doing or... Um, where I am financially, where I am physically, it's wherever I am. I want to stand in that, in the presence of love and to always have that mm-hmm. be what people feel when they leave me. Mm-hmm. And even if they can't put their finger on it, even if they can't say, oh, I just felt love from Dash. I, <laughs> I, that's what I want to leave behind. It's just this incredible trail of, I really tried to love. And what about your blessings? What are you the most grateful for? Right off the top of my my son, of course, yeah, the greatest. I really, truly, my family of friends. I'm so pleased to wow, see that. that's emotional. I know <laughs> it is emotional, but it's important. That's at the heart. But yeah. the idea that you had this rocky beginning with so mm-hmm. much suffering, and that you've come now to a place in your life where love is the primary force. Mm-hmm. And I see that is probably always been there. And people, whether it's they get it from an energetic perspective or they actually hear words, they respond to that and both in a negative and positive way. And certainly what I went through, I mean, I look at what some little kids are going through right now in their lives. We're looking at the Middle East right now and Ukraine. And I think, oh my God, my childhood was nothing. The the issues that I had was nothing compared to what these kiddos are going through and what they have to live through, hopefully live through and deal with later on in life. So I do, yes, everything is relative, but at the same time, I also say, really, I had it okay. And that being a kid who was bullied, that's helped me in my life, when there's been tough times. Mm -hmm. So even that, even being bullied, is now, I can say that was a blessing, Mm -hmm. because it gave me a perspective, a different perspective in handling things that come down the road. So it does go to that, everything that happens to us affects us, but it's also They are the lessons that we grow from. And everything that happens to us will serve us. Some of it we might not know because we don't know what comes next, right? Mm -hmm. How does all of this serve us in our next life or Mm -hmm. afterlife? And I'm going to sit here and say everything is serving us to a greater good. And we might not know that greater good. We don't need to. Mm -hmm. Just knowing 
just the knowing that this life serves me in the bigger picture. I don't need to know what the bigger picture is. I think we get so hung up on what's next, what's next, what's next, that we're just these beings that are going through this experience. We don't even know. We have no yeah. idea why we're really here. It's so interesting it's a, to think a, of it that way. Yeah. It's a, it, oh and, and just to go, this is an exciting experiment. Yeah. Let's just you know, enjoy Someday it. I'll know. Someday I'll know the results of it. Yeah. But my role in this is to bring faith to the table, to bring humor to the table. Mm-hmm. And ultimately with those two things, we create joy. And in joy is where we find love. I really believe that strongly. What a perfect sentiment to end this beautiful conversation <laughs> on. Thank you so much for joining oh, me. Oh, Mitzi, Dash. thank you. Thank you. It's been so this great. Is, this has been wonderful and scary and fun. So thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.